remain standing for a moment. I need to pray, not for you, but for me. When I was driving here tonight uh, from Beardsley to just past Union Hills, the traffic just slowed to a snail's pace. And I started to get a little anxious. I hate being late for anything. If I'm going to be one minute late, I'm texting. I'm one minute late. So I have to come in and I have to get mic'd up and I've got to go through the sound checks and everything. And I needed some things printed. And it didn't turn out the way that I had hoped. And I got to tell you, even though I've been preaching for 30 years, and you may think that somebody like Pastor Tommy or myself, Pastor Luke, Pastor, all of the preachers, all of the communicators, we just have this thing down. You would be wrong. And it raised some anxiety in me, and it provided a slight distraction. And I feel like what I have to say tonight is too important. For somebody here tonight, for me to be distracted, for me to be anxious. So would you pray with me and for me so that I can deliver what I need to deliver? Father, tonight, this is your time. These are your children, your sons and your daughters, and we say, not today, Satan. Not today, not tonight, not tomorrow, not ever. We give him no quarter. We bless your name. Now bless this message, I pray, Jesus. And everyone said, amen. amen. You may be seated. I want to give a shout out to some of our campuses, to those that are watching at Scottsdale. Pastor Arian and his crew there have over 100 and some people there tonight in their fusion groups to the White Mountains, to Colorado City, and anyone else that's watching online. Tonight, I want to get right to it. And I've entitled this message, What to Do when you get a death threat. What to do when you get a death threat. In today's society, death threats are taken very, very seriously. They are no longer just kind of tongue in cheek, ha ha ha. It is a, an offense that can be prosecuted and it's punishable by law. And depending on the severity and the circumstances in which those words were spoken, when threats of death were uttered, it really will depend on the length of term that that person would be incarcerated. And tonight I want to kind of use that thought of a death threat, and I want to kind of use it as a metaphor because that, in my opinion, that's exactly what Satan does so many times with each and every one of us. Even before you may find yourself in an all-out attack or an assault, you may be attacked and assaulted by the very things that he's suggesting. And sometimes he gets victories, not so much because he defeated us, but because we defaulted, because we took the death threats that he is suggesting so much so to heart that we end up falling on our swords. And tonight I want to go to a story that in my opinion uh, there is a death threat that is occurring and it, to me, it unpacks what we should do when Satan comes calling and he's trying to steal and kill and destroy the hope and dream of God that God has deposited into your life, that God has for us as his children, that God has for us as the body of Christ here in America. And Satan certainly has no shortage of lies and deceptions that he is trying to pass off as the truth here today. And tonight I want to take you to Isaiah chapter 36. And I want to read the first verse and I just want to set it up and then I'm just going to say a few more things and we're going to be out on time for our fusion groups. But in Isaiah 36 it said, Now it came to pass in the 14th year of King Hezekiah that Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. In 2 Chronicles 32, there's a parallel narrative of the telling of this story. And the wording of it uh, has always fascinated me because it's almost counterintuitive of what we're, what we're taught and what we believe and what we stand on. And yet the word declares, after these deeds of faithfulness, that's when the enemy showed up. And for some of us, we have a hard time getting our heads wrapped around that because you're like, okay, if, if Hezekiah was faithful... Why would he find himself in the biggest battle of his life? It would be one thing to say, after these deeds of unfaithfulness, after these deeds of disobedience, 
after these deeds of walking away from the will of God for his life, yes, you're going to reap the whirlwind. But how do you do the math when you've been faithful and the deeds that you have sown are the seeds of righteousness that you have planted in the name of the Lord, and instead of arriving at the harvest, you find yourself in another battle? And so here is King Hezekiah, and he was righteous. He tore down idols. He reestablished worship. He did so many things that were right in the sight of God, and that after all of these deeds of faithfulness, this is when the enemy shows up. And interestingly enough, when the enemy shows up, the very first place that he attacks are within the territories of the tribe of Judah. Don't be surprised that when the enemy shows up, before he does anything else, he will do everything in your power to try to silence and steal your praise. Our praise, God inhabits the praises of his people. When it says that God is enthroned in, in, in Psalms 22, enthroned among the praises of his people, God is always on his throne. To imply that God is still on the throne is to imply that he could come off the throne. That is incorrect theology. God is forever on the throne. No one or no thing can ever take God off the throne. But we're talking about the thrones of our hearts. And when we begin to praise God, God begins to send in the moving crew. God begins to send in the construction crew and begins to build the throne within our heart. And it's significantly, vitally important that we remain the people of praise. I think it's awesome here tonight. And I think it's a byproduct of the prayers that are going up every morning at 6 a.m. I got to tell you tonight, I've been around this church for a long time. The praises that were coming out of the house tonight, there is something happening not only in prayer, but also in praise. I love where the Bible says, you got me going now. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. And if you're going to be a warrior, you got to be a worshiper. Can somebody say amen? amen. So here, here comes the enemy after, after Hezekiah has been faithful and he sets up shop, but he's not satisfied. He's just not satisfied basically to silence Judah, to silence the praise he wants to demolish, he wants to dismantle. he wants to discredit everything about Hezekiah and his righteous rule. And the Bible says this is when basically he starts sending some death threats. And as a premise tonight, I want to, tell, I want to make this statement. All death threats of the enemy are built upon half-truths, lies, and deceptions. So I just want to give you a few lies tonight that I see in this story that many times, if you're not careful, you can take them as the truth, and the lie becomes the truth to you. So number one, you can't be serious, and you're nothing but a joke. And the Bible says in Isaiah 36, 4, it says, then the name of this guy, I cannot pronounce biblical names or places. It said to them, now say, now say now to Hezekiah, thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, what confidence is this in which you trust? I say you speak of having plans and power of war. And in another version of the Bible says, your weapons, yeah, my, your, your words are no match for my weapons. He, just, he was saying, you're just all talk. And he said, listen, even if I show up with the weakest and the lamest and my, not my A team, not my B team, not my, on the D list, if I show up with those bench warmers, we're still going to kick your butts. And he was suggesting to Hezekiah as he sends out this death threat to an emissary, to an ambassador, to someone who's delivering this message, saying, you can't be serious that you are considering even taking a stand against me. Look what I've done to the surrounding nations. Look what I've done to some of your buddies. Look to some of the guys that you used to be allied with, but you're not allied with them anymore because I've, I've taken them into my captivity. Now, now they're under my foot. Now they're under my reign. And what makes you think? You tell me that you've got trust in God. What God are you talking about? Because all of the nations that I've taken on and I have basically rolled over and now they're, I've left them for dead in the wake of my might and power. They had their gods too. You claim that you have your God. Huff, your words, your words, just words. And your words are no match for my weapons. And what Satan is trying to tell us tonight, I would say, ecumenically speaking, from, from, from coast to coast, 
across the board in the body of Christ. And now let's personalize it right here to Dream City Church saying, come on, Dream City, you can't be serious. Haven't you seen what I've done in this congregation? Haven't you seen what I've done to this denomination? Haven't you seen what I've done to the churches all throughout the Phoenix Metroplex area? They're shutting down. They're closing their doors. They can't make their payments. And uh, they, they're disbanding. And what makes you think that you're going to have a different outcome than them? You can't be serious. And you're nothing but a joke. And sometimes we get paralyzed at those thoughts. If you think about it, when Goliath came out, he came out every morning and every night and presented himself. And he said, give me one guy. And think about it. D Goliath had them completely paralyzed and shaking in their boots without ever, without ever taking his sword out of the sheath, without ever raising his shield, without ever, ru without ever running towards them in, in a battle formation. He shut them down with the death threat. And he almost did the same thing with David because he mocked David. He tried to intimidate David. He's like, you're coming at me with a stick? Come on, man. And Satan will try to tell you, you are ill-prepared, you're ill-equipped, you're no match for me, but I want you to know tonight, the devil is a liar. Can somebody say amen? amen. Number two, number two, your problems exist because the Lord has a problem with you. In this story, and I want you to read it for yourself a little bit later on, here's what the message says. Here's what's written into the death threat. Have I now come up without the Lord against this land to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. The nerve of this, of this king, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, he's now implying, listen, you're not even on the side of the Lord. God has abandoned you, God has forgotten you, God has rejected you, God's done with you, and he's left you for dead, and now I'm coming in to take over. Because God has handed you over to me. And let me tell you what, that is one of the most devastating and, de and deceitful lies that Satan could purport out towards the children of God. When he tells a son or a daughter of God, listen, God is not even on your side anymore. And sometimes, because of our past, because of the shame and the guilt and the condemnation, sometimes we carry, even though we know the scriptures, there's no condemnation, and yet we carry around those baggage. You know, when Saul was anointed king for the very first time in 1 Samuel, the Bible says the anointing of God was upon him. He prophesied, God gave him a new heart, he was changed into another man. But yet, when they went looking for him, he was hidden among the baggage. Many times the anointing of God is upon us and God is breathing life into us and, and God is recreating us in his image and great things are happening. The problem is when God comes looking for us and when others come looking for us, we've, we've hidden ourselves among the baggage. And here is the second lie, the nerve. But this is Satan. He is the master manipulator. He is the father of all lies. And I would not be surprised to learn tonight that there would be at least some here tonight where Satan is in your ear saying, well, isn't it obvious that you're not on the side of the Lord? Because if you're on the side of the Lord, you wouldn't have lost your job. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be going through this medical crisis. You, you, you wouldn't have this family situation in your home. Your son or daughter wouldn't have gone prodigal. You wouldn't have all of this chaos and you wouldn't have all of this crisis because in the absence of those things, obviously that is a representation uh, of the favor of God. And yesterday morning I was talking about the favor of God, but we must remember that the Bible says it in Hebrews, I believe, in chapter 5, that Jesus, though he was a son, now you got to get this, you and I are sons and daughters of God because we've been grafted into the vine, we're adopted that way, but Jesus Christ is the only begotten son, and the Bible says, though he was a son, he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. And I want you to know, there is not a person alive that is exempt from all suffering in this life. And I want you to know the battle is real, the struggle is real, life is difficult, but that is no excuse to begin to believe that God has forgotten you, that God has abandoned you. Sometimes in the midst of those things, it's not that God is just going to eliminate all your problems, but God is going to infuse himself into you so that you're equal to any crisis that's coming against you. So that you know, and Paul, doesn't Paul talk about that? That even in, in, in his weakness, Christ was made strong. And he recognized, he's like, well, if that's the case, 
then I'm, I'm going to gladly boast in my weakness. And that's tough for us in our American culture because we're all about, and, and even our, our, our sermon on Sunday was about posturing up, pulling ourselves up by the bootstraps. I'm all about it, you guys. I'm, I'm there. That's my mentality. But sometimes when the Bible talks about, I can't believe how fast I'm talking here tonight, but when the, when the Bible says, he restores my soul, in Psalms 23, I read the book by Philip Keller, A Shepherd's Look at the 23rd Psalm, and what he talks about there is the shepherd coming along because a sheep, the way that its weight is distributed throughout its body, when it goes onto its back, it is unable to right itself. It's unable to just come say, well, I'm just going to get up. I fell, I tripped, I stumbled, I, I'm down on the ground. It has to have the shepherd come to restore it. And there are times when, quite honestly, and I have been there, and man, I've got, I believe I've got a, 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 a reasonable amount of grit and grind and willpower and let's go. But I can, I can tell you, there's been times where I've been flat out on my back, emotionally, spiritually, professionally, in so many different ways, and I needed the good shepherd to come and to restore me and to put me back up on my feet so I can continue on down the road. Amen? Yeah. Amen! Amen! Yeah. I'm preaching better than your amen and That's still pretty lame. Let's go on. Number three. Lie number three. The only way out is to agree and align yourself with your adversary. Isaiah 36, 16. Don't listen to Hezekiah. Now, now this emissary is talking to the people of God because he's trying to discredit Hezekiah because he has trust and confidence in God. It's like, don't listen to Hezekiah. For thus says the king of Assyria, make peace with me by a, by by a president and come out to me, every one of you. And then here's what I'm going to offer you. I'm going to offer you your own farm, your own land, your own acreage, your own place, your own vine. Your, I'm going I'm to make all your dreams come true. And sometimes when we're in those times of crisis and we receive those debt threats and Satan is suggesting he's about to take you out, compromise can sound pretty enticing. It's like, well, that's, that, that doesn't sound so bad. But at the end of the day, when you buy into that, to whatever measure, from that moment on, you're in bondage. You're no longer free. You're no lo you no longer belong to God. You now belong to the king of Assyria. And those, that temptation sometimes just to, okay, I, I just need this resolved. My, my, my home life and, and, and the things that are happening in my heart and my head that it, is so out of control. Where do I sign? So that I can get out of this mess. And it sounds so tempting. It sounds so great. In Acts chapter 27, the Bible says they were waiting for some favorable wind so they could set sail for Rome. And Paul was among those passengers. And the Bible says when a gentle south wind began to blow, they said, giddy up. This is awesome. This is exactly what we were praying for. This is an answer to our prayers. And they set sail. Now Paul stood and he said, guys, guys, guys. This is not of God. In fact, this is the opposite of what God intends for us. And if we take these wins, if we settle for this, it's not going to end well for us. And sure enough, they ended up in shipwreck. And I want you to know, when you begin to settle, when you begin to sign off on a compromise, sooner or later, sometimes it's sooner, sometimes it's later, sooner or later, you're going to end up in shipwreck. It's just going to happen. And we play, you know, it's great, from Monty Hall back in the 70s and all the weirdos that would dress up and let's make a deal. And that sometimes that's exactly how Satan will play it. Let's make a deal. All you have to do is sign right here. Just sign right here. Let's make a deal. But let's make a deal. It's nothing more than a dead end. Number four, and this is something I said earlier. As someone comes to the keyboard, how am I doing? Five minutes. Amen. Your words are no match for my weapons. So initially, when they come out, they're like, you know, all, all you can do is talk about it. Talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. But as I thought about that and when I read it in the message, when I prepare a message, I read it in about six different versions. And those are the words that jumped out of me. And here's the reality. That is a lie from the pit of hell. But here's the truth that you can stand in. Here's the truth. Your weapons, as we say back to the enemy, your weapons are no match for my word. My word from God. My promise from God. 
what God has enlisted me for, what God has placed in me, more than just the promise before me, what he has placed in me. And what I have in terms of God's word and God's revelation and God's heart and God's hope for my life is so much greater than anything that's coming against me. And we got to recognize in those times when Satan comes in and says, listen, your words are no match for my weapons. We just turn it around and say, nah, you have it backwards, Jack. Not today, Satan, because your weapons are no match for my word. Can I get a witness in the house here today? So how do you, what do you do when you get a death threat? Go ahead and stand with me at this time. What do you do when you get a, a death threat? And I'll just paraphrase through the rest of this. Here's what Hezekiah did. Such a wise man. The Bible says he took the letter. And he didn't call a meeting. He didn't gather all of his intercessors. And there's nothing wrong with that. But sometimes you just got to do some things on your own. The Bible says that he took the letter. He went up into the temple. And he spread the letter out. In the presence of the Lord. This morning, Pastor Brad was talking about being in the presence of the Lord. And, you know, I think it was T.D. Jakes that said this years ago, you can, de- you can tell the level of maturity of a person by how few people they tell when they're going through a crisis. The less mature a person is that you've got to tell everybody. Here's what Hezekiah did. He didn't tell anyone but God. And he basically went into the presence of God and he had this letter and he's like, God in the natural, all of those things in the natural are true. But in my spirit and because of my relationship with you, I do not accept those as truths. I believe every one of those things is a deception. Every one of those things is a lie. And yes, I don't have the military. Yes, I don't have the, the armed forces. Yes, I, I don't have those things. But I got you. And here's what the enemy is saying. He's saying I can't survive. He says that I can't resist. He's saying that I can't contend. He says I don't have any future. He's, he's telling my people that I'm full of it, that I'm crazy because I'm putting my confidence and trust in you. I don't know what to do with this God, but you do. And when we come in here on Monday, on, on every morning, during the 21 days, that's what we're doing. We're basically bringing in these prayer requests saying, I, I don't know what to do, but you do. And I think that's a good place to be. I think we need to stop pretending and putting on this air of sophistication that we've got it figured out. I don't have it figured out. I wish I could tell you, I'm a leader of people, a preacher of the gospel. People look to me to lead them, and I, I barely know how to lead myself sometimes. But what I do know what to do is to take it to someone who knows how to lead me. God, I don't know how this is going to work out. I don't know where to turn. I don't know what decision to make. I don't know. I don't know. But you do. And because, the Bible says, because Hezekiah prayed, God's like, that's my boy. That's my boy. You read through the rest of the story. He sent out one angel, smoked. Oh, he didn't smoke. That's my term. Eliminated 185,000 of the adversaries in one night. Let me tell you what. God can accomplish far more. You can pool all your resources all you want. At the end of the day, you're not going to get there from here without the Spirit of the Lord. Without the intervention of God. Without God's sovereignty and supernatural grace and power showing up in your life. And as you go to your small groups tonight, we have some questions. Pastor Brad, come on up here. He's going to dismiss us here in a moment. But I want you to know tonight, don't listen to those deceptions. Don't take those half-truths and turn them into a truth that leads you down the wrong path. There is a, there is a way that seems right unto a man. It may make sense to you, but God is saying, don't trust your own judgment Bring that to me. Would you lift your hands with me all over this place? God, tonight I I did my best to present the heart of this message. And the heart of this message is that you have a heart for your sons and daughters. And more than anything else, you want us to bring our needs, our troubles, our death threats, 
all of those lies and deceptions and those things, Lord, that would cause us to fear and to doubt and to dread the very essence of this life that you have caused us to, to live. I speak to people tonight, Lord, that, that, that King Sennacherib is standing on the front step and he's knocking on the door ready to present a death threat, or maybe he's already presented it. And he's saying, your marriage isn't going to survive. Your children are not going to survive. Your business isn't going to survive. You're not going to survive. Oh, you still may be drawing breath in this life. But in terms of really surviving and thriving, no, that's not going to happen. You, you've passed that point of no return. But the devil is a liar. I thank you, Lord, for the times, the many times, when I was down and out, and I didn't even know how to pick myself up again. You came. You picked me up like the good shepherd. You set me back on my feet and you set me on a rock that was higher than I. For anyone who feels like they're down and out tonight, by your spirit, come. and Provide that uplift to them, I pray. And everyone said, amen. Let's welcome Pastor Brad.